Today, you were as racist as Paula Dean, famous chef, using the N-word on her employees. Today, you were as racist as former basketball player Shaquille O'Neal, using a Chinese accent on national television. Today, you were as racist as Harry Styles, donning a Native American headdress, typically reserved for tribal elders. Unknowingly, you spread racist ideas, ideals, and assumptions around your workplace, school, or home. Shocking, and you may be confused, but I'm gonna ask that we suspend our disbelief for a moment so that I can explain. Let me start from the beginning. It was the first day of school. I had just started public school after private school. New faces, new teachers, new playgrounds, new school. The teacher had just started calling roll, and it was really bright and early. When she got to my name, she paused for a minute and she said, oh boy. She proceeded to call out my name with the wrong pronunciation. Little first grade me immediately corrected her. Oh, my name's Thage. She tried one or two more times, but she couldn't get it. And in the end, she threw her hands up and said, you know what, this is too hard. I'm not gonna bother. Why don't I call you Tej? That's the way it's, it's pronounced. Little first grade me accepted because little first grade me didn't want to be difficult for anyone. My name is spelled with three letters, T, E, and J. You'd think that's an easy thing to pronounce. Unfortunately, it's not spelled the way it's supposed to be pronounced. That's actually the way it's supposed to be spelled, Th. And the problem was that Indian, people who aren't raised in an Indian household or speak an Indian language can't say the thug sound to correctly pronounce Indian names. So going back to that teacher, when she said, this is too difficult, there was a hidden message behind those words, an implied racist message that upon reflection years later, I finally understand. That hidden message was, look, you're Indian, and your name is not normal. So instead of me trying to learn your name and the correct pronunciation, I'm going to Americanize it and turn it into something that fits my way of thinking. That teacher unknowingly was committing a racial microaggression against me. A microaggression, while definitions vary depending on who you ask, well, the simplified version of that academic definition is that a microaggression are the everyday things we say or do that are full of unintended discrimination and full of hidden messages that are discriminatory, whether they're anti-LGBT, racist, sexist, ableist, ageist, etc. Today, I want to focus on racial microaggressions. Now, these are, these are actions or words that have hidden racist messages. To clarify, Racial microaggressions don't need to happen between a majority group and a minority group. They can happen between anyone, an Indian person and a Chinese person, a white person and a black person. They can happen between anyone. Here in the Bay Area, we're home to one of the most diverse communities in the entire United States. With such interaction between cultures, racial microaggressions are rampant. Here's just a few examples of what racial microaggressions look like. A girl of Hispanic descent is the only person of color in her AP class. When they start a discussion about a Spanish tradition, everyone looks directly at her, expecting an answer. That's a microaggression. The hidden message, You're, you look Spanish, so you must know the answer to all things relating to Spanish culture even though you're actually from the United States and from Mexico. Scenario number two. A white woman is walking down the street when she sees an African-American teenager. And when she sees that teenager, she clutches her purse a little bit tighter. That's a microaggression. The hidden message is that you, people of your skin color, will try to rob me. Scenario number three. 
Um, a girl of Middle Eastern descent has moved to the uh, moved to your school, and you ask her, "Where are you from?" She answers, the "United States of America." You ask her again, "Where are you really from?" That's a microaggression. Hidden message: You're not a real American because you don't look like an American. While these may seem like small things, that's exactly what microaggressions are. They're the everyday things we do or say that are full of unintended discrimination based on racist stereotypes. It's important to note that intent does not equal impact. The most common excuse that people have when they commit microaggressions is that the aggressor will say, oh, I didn't mean it like that. But intent does not equal impact. If we intend for our actions to not be offensive, even if someone even if we intend our actions to not be offensive, if someone takes offense to that action, then that action has had a negative impact on another human being. And that's wrong. So, now let's talk about all the people who think that microaggressions aren't a real thing. Everyone out there who thinks that microaggressions aren't a real thing, think that it's a bunch of political correctness BS. For example, Matt Walsh, self-described blogger, writer, father of twins, bourbon enthusiast, and noted alpaca grooming expert, when he tweeted out, my wife just asked me to take out the garbage. Is that a microaggression or just a regular aggression? Well, to Mr. Walsh and to all the naysayers, go back to the definition of a microaggression. A microaggression is an action or word with a hidden discriminatory message. So, when your wife asks you to take out the garbage, hopefully, there isn't any discrimination there. Your wife is simply asking you to do a chore. And so that's why that's not a microaggression. Now that we sort of understand what microaggressions are and we put to rest all those naysayers, let's talk about the real impact of microaggressions, the harms. Now these harms can be summarized into two main areas. The first area, which I already touched upon a little bit when we discussed the name debacle, is identity. Every time we make a microaggression, we're passing judgment on another human being, on their identity, on the characteristics that make them who they are. For example, with the name issue, what that teacher was basically saying is with, this is too difficult. She was saying, your name is too foreign, too not American. That was an attack on a fundamental aspect of my identity. Unfortunately, these attacks on identity, especially for minority groups, is quite widespread. According to a survey done by the Cultural Diversity and Ethnic Minority Psychology Branch of the American Psychological Association, over a period of 90 days, the average student of color experiences 291 microaggressions. That comes down to about three microaggressions every single day. That's three times a day, someone asking you, no, where are you really from? Three times a day, someone clutching their purse when they walk by you. Three times a day, your fellow students, your peers, your teachers, your colleagues, picking up a hammer and a nail and chipping away at what makes you, you. The second harm of microaggressions is stereotypes, and specifically promulgating racist stereotypes against minority cultures. Behind every racist, behind every racial microaggression, there's a racial, there's a racist assumption made about that person. For example, if an African-American girl was going to a Ivy League university, and you went up to her and said, you must be so thankful for affirmative action. The racist assumption is that African-American people are not smart. And so the hidden message there is that you are not smart enough to get into this prestigious university by yourself. So you must have relied on affirmative action to get you in. We especially see microaggressions in our media, the media that we consume. Even in my favorite movie, Mean Girls, you can see microaggressions everywhere. And it's not that I'm looking for microaggressions. 
It's the fact that they're there. For example, from the movie, Caddy Karen has just moved from Africa to the United States. Both her parents are originally from Michigan, and she's white. So, when she introduces herself to this girl, Karen Smith, arguably one of the dumbest girls to ever be in a movie, um, Karen, understandably, might say, so, if you're from Africa, why are you white? Hidden message, all people from Africa have black skin. So it confuses me when you say that you're from Africa and you have white skin. Granted, this movie was purely comical in nature, but the fact was that the microaggression was there. We've allowed discrimination and racist stereotypes to continue in a much more nuanced, but equally hurtful way. Microaggressions have done so much harm, and as we continue to look forward, until we break the barriers that society has placed on these people, these minority groups, marginalized groups will never... This is why microaggressions and the continuation of these stereotypes have allowed many positions to be held by white men. For example, 80% of the U.S. House of Representatives is full of white men. 80 to 85% of the U.S. Senate is occupied by white men. And 92% of the Forbes 400 executive level CEO positions are held by white men. While it may seem a little weird that white men are so rampant within our leadership, it's unfortunately true. And the reason that we place, uh, we place power in 33% of the, uh, we, Sorry, we place the power in a part of the population that only makes up 33% of the population. Simply put, that's not fair, and that's not what true equality looks like. Because of that one microaggression a decade ago, my name is Tej. From that point on, I began to introduce to myself to people as Tej, because I wanted to bypass that initial awkwardness of being difficult when asking them to pronounce it correctly. From that day on, the identity given to me by my parents was superseded by the identity given to me by that teacher. Ultimately, that really has ingrained Tej as a part of my identity, and today I don't see that changing. Tej has become a part of who I am because of a 30 second conversation with a teacher. So don't be like me. Don't let that 30 second conversation fundamentally change who you are. Psychologist and Columbia University professor Daryl Wing Su puts it best. The fight against microaggressions is about making the invisible visible. So as we move forward, we need to make sure that we make the invisible visible. When someone commits a microaggression, we should tell them. The real solution is awareness and encouraging people to see the error of their ways. So we are also a part of the solution because we, as we become more savvy, more cautious, and more aware in our actions and words, we're becoming better citizens of this world. Ultimately, our words and our actions have limitless power over the people around us. And it's important that we control that power. Stop subconsciously promulgating negative ideas about other people and make sure that you correct other people when they do that. So tomorrow, you could be as racist as all those aforementioned celebrities. If you walk out the door tonight and you throw away the idea of microaggressions into the trash, you will be continuing this nuanced form of discrimination. You might think you're not a part of the problem, but I promise you, the observant and kind people of the world will see right through that facade. You will be a part of the problem. You may not be making huge, sweeping declarations about Mexicans or Muslims, but you will be promulgating negative ideas and racist ideas throughout the entirety of your life. So let's change together. Let's stop subconsciously making these negative ideas move forward. 
let's try and end racism. Because as long as microaggressions exist, racism still exists as well. Thank you.